Good day ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Victor and today we're going to be having a look at a AI system that I created for the Potlands. Uh, the AI system we're going to be having a look at is something I created out of a need for proper dinosaur AI. Uh, we ran into the problem that, you know, as much as we wanted to create proper AI within the stock systems in UE4, um, quite frankly it wasn't really doable because Unreal Engine has this magical assumption that AI turns on the spot and moves backwards and sideways whenever the flying fuck it wants and doesn't really behave according to the behavior that any normal animal or even human would show. Um, it's a problem I've seen a lot of people struggle with uh, but no one has really offered any public solutions um, other than, you know, rolling out root motion for every single non-player character out there, which isn't exactly a viable solution, especially not on a game like I was. Um, so we ended up doing, well, what I'm about to show. So this is a custom AI system, custom path following, not path finding. We're using the standard nevmesh system, which I can show if we just press P here. You'll see this is a standard nevmesh. Um, we're pulling data from that and then we're using the path generation and path finding from that and we're modifying it to suit our own needs a bit more. Um, so, for starters, let's just have a look at what the animals do when we just simulate here for a second. So, what you'll see is they just move around. The animation blueprint here is nicely integrated with the animal behavior that it's bound to. Uh, so you can see that we've got physics on the tails as they move around, the animations synchronize nicely. Uh, we do this thing on the animations here, um, where rather than just having an idle pose that they transition into when they're not moving, they transition into basically the same animation as their walking animation, but then with zero vertical offset. So they ground their feet in whatever position they were in when they stopped moving, which makes it look significantly less slidey. This guy is trying to navigate to 000, um, because he is a special class, which we'll get to in a second. We have an actor at 000, which we can drag around to make him move. Um, this guy is having a blast going off to the edge of the world. Uh, as you can see, we've got lots of additive animation blending going on just to make everything look nice and dynamic. They twitch their arms, they twitch their feet, they twitch their head, their tails, everything like that. The head is somewhat physics-based, the neck is, uh, the tail is physics-based, and their turns are additive blends. Uh, we tried to do it physics-based, but we ended up running into the problem that um, it was too hard to control and there were too many issues with, like, their forward vectors conflicting with what we want the turn animation to look like so we ended up just making it static additive animations uh, they're just single frame animations poses that we overlay with the rest of the animations where they tilt sideways somewhat that is applied based on the speed and their current turning desire not the actual turn rate but how badly they want to turn um Right now, none of them are running, unfortunately. It's getting foggy over here, so uh, that is why that's happening. Um, this is a little dude who is having a bit of a seizure because he wants to get to 000, zero, zero but can't because he's above 000. zero, zero. Um, I'm wondering where the other ones went. You'll also see that we're getting a little bit laggy here. That has to do with the insane amount of hellos that we're logging. I'll just go quickly disable that. Um, that has to do with a little thing I had to debug just before we started. Uh, that's happening many, 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 many times. And an interesting thing about logging is actually that uh, the performance hit of the logging activity itself isn't necessarily that big. Um, but if you leave something logging for ages, then it will just lock up your engine. So you see now if we click output log, it'll just freeze the engine for a little while because there's so much pointless logging going on that it needs to load in now. Uh, I'll just pause the video until I have cleared that log, but that should help our performance go up a bit again. Cool. So we've gone in and cleared that log, as you can see, and now our performance should be absolutely fine again. There's also some minor error going on because I have... Uh, an extra class here that isn't compatible with the animation blueprint but I made that class for demo purposes so it'll just have to deal. Anyway, uh, here we go, we have the bunch. Um, 
I would like for one of them to start running, quite frankly. Uh, as you can see, we don't have local avoidance because honestly it would just be too performance heavy. And what you saw there was one of them phasing through a wall. Um, you'll see that they always try to navigate around any obstacles in their way. Uh, if you look at the nav mesh, we have a relatively wide margin around every single obstacle. That has to do with the fact that because of the forward movement, they like to cut the corners a bit close. So to compensate, we just increase the padding around every single obstacle and then that compensates and makes them navigate around it smoothly. Because this entire system is built around making them navigate um, exclusively forwards, we run into the issue that uh, really they just... Where, where did it go? Oh, doing that made it just kind of die. That's a big shame. Uh, let's hope we can set in on another one. No, we cannot. Okay. Uh, then I will go in here and set debug on that one special snowflake. Um, I forgot a little bit what I was saying. The right, the thing uh, with them phasing through the walls has to do with the fact that we're only letting them move forward. Uh, that's the gist of this path finding system, a path following system. We don't let anything move for a sideways or backwards or anything like that. They have to move forwards. They can control their speed and they can control their turning rates. They cannot control their motion direction. What that means is that they can easily get stuck because if you can only move forwards it's very easy to work yourself into a corner and never be able to get out because you don't understand how to get the hell out of it again because the computer like once it gets stuck in one of these corners it's off the nav mesh it won't understand that it just needs to move backwards so turn 180 degrees and move that way a bit and then it will be on track again um, so what we've done instead is just if it's stuck for more than like 0.1 second we disable their collision for a little bit once they're back on the nav mesh, we re-enable their collision and we just make sure that they don't collide with stuff. That way we still have collision with, you know, things like the player and that sort of thing. Uh, but it helps the AI not constantly get stuck on every little thing. So, what you'll see now is that this guy now has pathfinding debugs going on and I disabled the sphere drawing. That is an absolute shame. I'll just go enable that. Alright, so we've quickly enabled the uh, debug drawing on this guy um, because we've got the debug flag enabled obviously our performance will tank a little bit again but what you can see here is um, you can see the previews of the navigation points that it uses so if we make it go here for instance you'll see that it tries to navigate like this the yellow points are the points that ue4 generates from the get-go um, we've run into the problem that uh, it's just decided to stand still. It's actually kind of convenient. UE4, when it generates a path, it generates it very tightly around every single corner in existence. We ran into the issue with the AI that if we did that all the time, um, it would never really uh, navigate nicely because it would keep trying to get around corners that were too tight for it because there weren't enough points for it to work with. So what we do instead is we add all of those little orange points you see there, which are subdivisions of the line. So basically what we do is what you would traditionally call relaxing a line. Um, so we just, you know, in, in modeling terms, it would be subdividing. We just add more points and we interpolate their position based on what the rest around it has been doing. And then, and this is very important to how the system actually ends up looking nice, we remove the original path points. If we kept those original path points, you can see that it ends up deviating and not looking nice. Uh, so we're removing everything that was there originally and we're replacing it with every single one of our own. You can also see like inside, for instance, the starting point, there's an orange sphere inside of that. So the orange spheres are the ones that we end up using for the navigation. The yellow ones are what UE4 generates. If we weren't relaxing, it would be severely cutting corners and all that sort of thing. Um, really, there's not that much more to show about this entire system because at the core of it, it really is just, you know, animation, integration, and 
the AI moving properly along obstacles and that sort of thing. Um, this scene is significantly more densely packed than our scenes are in the Podlands. Uh, we decided, for instance, to disable collision and navigation blocking on almost every single foliage asset, just because there wasn't enough reason for us to keep it on. Uh, and it caused issues with the AI that we would rather, you know, avoid. Um, but overall, it's been... Uh, it, it's worked really well for us in our given situation. I wouldn't recommend this for any given situation. Like, preferably what we would have done is uh, just work around the existing system and instead make not just a different path following system, but a different path finding system, which accounts for the smoothed corners and the directionality as well. Because how UE4's path finding system works is it just uses positions and then based on that position it goes okay so then we should go to this position and then to this position it doesn't use orientation in its calculations which means that in turn um, you end up having problems with well quite simply the orientation not being accounted for and therefore things trying to move sideways and such um, preferably you'd replace that unfortunately that's not as easy as it sounds um, so we decided to opt for the simpler solution, which is just hack the existing system to work a little nicer. Um, worked well enough for us in our use cases because, quite frankly, we don't need perfect AI in terms of collision and that sort of thing because um, we don't have a lot of colliders. And for as far as we do have them, the AI doesn't need to navigate around them tightly, so it's worked well enough for us. Um, but it definitely has its caveats. Honestly, the biggest part that makes our AI system actually look good in its own right is how we've animated it and how we've integrated the two. So we have very tight transitions between the different movement states. We have four different locomotion animations just in terms of, uh, you know, the um, actual movement. So we have a idle, which is grounded, walk, uh, then we have a walk, we have a trot, we have a run. The trot really barely serves any purpose other than to transition between the walk and the run, and occasionally when an animal decides that it's a little bit too far away from something for its own liking, it'll uh, use the trot to get a little bit closer. For instance, there's one AI setting where they herd, and uh, when the animals herd and one animal in the pack falls behind it'll transition to trotting just to catch up um, the biggest thing is just you know doing all those little things like the little transitions these little animations all that sort of thing that you know normal animals do all the time but things that get neglected very quickly in games because it's an afterthought and nobody really stops to think about how the animals should move specifically because generally the games aren't about the animals in our case it was like not exclusively um in the end the screen time of the actual animals and how much the player will obsessively be staring at them was limited but uh it was enough for us to decide uh that we wanted to really polish the way the animals move and feel um, so yeah, really I don't have that much else to add to this. If anybody has any questions on how we implemented it or why we did it the way we did, let me know if, you know, you happen to want to hire someone to do this sort of tech art stuff for you. Uh, I am currently available, though I doubt anybody relevant will really be watching this. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. Uh, obviously we're getting a little laggy now, that has to do with the uh, debug drawing. Um, if we use this on the classes we intended to use and without the debug draw enabled, then we easily run a hundred AI actors at a time um, without major performance hits. Obviously that's not counting the skeletal mesh drawing because that's just intense. But overall, like the logic side of things is really doable. It's not networked, that helps. Um, we don't do all kinds of fancy stuff that the uh, integrated character controller does do. Uh, the integrated movement components, I guess. 
Uh, but like the integrated movement component will sort of start dying on you performance wise at like 10 instances, whereas this will easily go up to 100 without major issues. Um, that is running on a 2700X, which is not the greatest for single threaded performance like this because uh, this entire system has been done in Blueprint, which means it is nowhere near multi threaded other than the Pathfinder goals. Uh, because UE4 multi-threads those under the hood because it does those async. I'm actually not entirely sure if that's true now that I think about it. I'm not sure if the calls we use for this specifically are async. They can be, but I don't think ours are. They should have been, but that would have been annoying to engineer because that stuff isn't easily exposed to blueprint. Um, so yeah, you know, really you should do this sort of thing in C++ because it just gives you a lot more freedom but unfortunately that wasn't really an option for the podlands specifically so we ended up doing it in blueprint and really it works well enough and it performs well enough and the core of the system was to just make them look really really good we don't need 3000 AI instances we just need like 10 and we need them to look good other than that we can simulate them at low fidelity so anyway um thank you guys for watching I hope you enjoyed this, for, found this insightful, whatever it may be. And uh, if you've got any requests on stuff you'd like to see me talk about, things that I've done for the Podlands or other projects that you happen to know of, and you're curious how or why we did things a certain way, definitely let me know. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Cheers. Signing off.